I put off teaching this chapter. I was going to do it last week and then thought, oh, I think I'll wait. (laughs) As I've been considering it and praying about it, it's not an easy one to go through. Some of you, I'm going to give you a warning, may have a hard time with with some of what I'm about to say this morning, but I I hope and pray two things. Uh, First of all, that you'll stay with it through the entire teaching, follow it through to the end, and secondly, and even more important, I hope and pray that our study of Psalm 58 will take us into worship, will lead us into worship. Psalm 58 in verse 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? No. In heart you work unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or skillful caster of spells. O God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, surely there's a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Father, help us with this one. And Lord, I do believe that you wanted us to talk about this on a Sunday morning. uh, For the most people possible in our fellowship to hear. And to consider these things, Lord, I I know it's not always about picking out the easy stuff. There's hard teaching in the Word as well. And I just ask that you will give us insight to understand not just what the psalm is about, the background, the history, what it means, but Lord, that we might understand your heart. That we might follow you for who you are. That we might, Lord, trust you in your truth and have understanding as servants of yours. Father, bless the study of your word this morning. Holy Spirit, teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 58. It is one of ten imprecatory psalms. Ten imprecatory psalms. Among the psalms, it's a hard pill to swallow, especially for those who rank high on the mercy and compassion scale. If that's you... This is the psalm that is difficult this morning. If you happen to be one of those who's looking for the battle, who doesn't mind taking out a few here and there, then you may really enjoy this. But the compassionate and the tender-hearted struggle with this. You know, we read verses like Matthew 5.43, where Jesus said, You've heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on righteous and unrighteous. And people, because of verses like Matthew 5, against Psalm 58, people say, oh, well, there's a judgmental God of the Old Testament, and there's the merciful, compassionate Jesus of the New Testament. They must be different. And the truth is, and you know this, they are not. So how do we square this? How do we reconcile these things where Jesus calls followers to compassion and love and tenderness while David talks about washing our feet in the blood of the wicked? How does that work? (laughs) One thing we cannot do with Psalm 58, and that is ignore it. Look at the heading. It says, For the choir director set to all Tashketh. A miktam of David. We've talked before about what a miktam is. It's a golden thing. It's a hidden thing. It's a a precious treasure. But all tashket, what does that mean? Literally, do not destroy. When David wrote this song, along with two others, Psalm 58, 59, and 75, they're the only three psalms that bear the title, all tashket. What does that mean? It means do not destroy. Keep it around. This is one that should not be lost among all of the Psalms. 
That alone caused me to look at it and think, well, we better take a second look. Do not destroy these words. Protect them. Protect this song for future generations. And you know, I think you might add, do not destroy because future generations will need this psalm. Don't erase these words from the pages of Scripture. Don't let them dissolve from your hearts. But it's happening. These words are dissolving in the church today. Definitely in society today. The attempt to erase the truth of God's righteous judgment out of our culture. It reminds me, I was thinking back in this, in this age that we're in where people are trying to erase out the things that are too hard or too difficult or, or sounding too judgmental in the name of, of this bland tolerance. It's like kindergartners or preschoolers. with You know how they handed you three things when you started into school. They handed you those fat pencils. <laughs> and they handed you those big pink erasers. And then they handed you that paper that is the thinnest paper on the planet. I mean, think about this. How many of you got through writing two letters before you ripped it? And then you got out the big pink eraser and and it's just ripping and shredding. And it's happening in our culture with the Word of God. It's as though people are pulling out erasers right and left to erase that which is offensive, the things that bother them, the things that are upsetting. Get it out. We don't need, we don't want to do the love and the compassion thing. And live and let live. And invite all the world to be who you are, whatever you are, and whatever that looks like. And let's not make any judgments about that, because, you know, who am I, a sinner, to judge someone else, a sinner as well? Do not destroy these words. A Holy Spirit-inspired David said, don't destroy these words. Psalm 58 is a blunt psalm. The words are tough, but for good reason. There is a background here, as with all of the psalms. The kingdom of Israel was fractured. Two warring camps, civil war, raged between the house of Saul and the house of David for seven and a half years. Second Samuel chapters 2 through 5 de- detail this situation where David comes to uh, Hebron and the tribe of Judah. They anoint him as king. Saul is dead. Saul has died on the field of battle. And so David is anointed by his tribe, but the rest of Israel, at least at the house of Saul, those followers of Saul, say, no, we won't have him as our king. And civil war breaks out. And there's fighting, and there's mistrust, and there are problems. But after seven and a half years, finally, finally things settle down, and all of Israel comes back down to Hebron and anoints David as king. He was anointed three times to be the king. Samuel anointed him when he was a teenager. And then Judah, the tribe, anointed him. And then seven and a half years later, finally all of Israel anointed David to be king. This was a young man who had to wait to see God's promises fulfilled. A long time in his life. But you don't come smoothly out of civil war. It's not an easy thing. One of the most uncivil places at that time was David's judicial system. And in this psalm, we hear David's cry to the Lord as judge against the crooked, biased judges of his day. Left over probably from the previous administration, Psalm 58 condemns an illegal legal system. It's a condemnation of an unjust judiciary that's led by those who, rather than offering the right judgments based on God's truth and His laws, were instead legislating from the bench. I know you can't relate to this. You know, in the world in which we live, let's join David in the courtroom this morning in Psalm 58. He makes a case against unrighteous judges and unrighteous judgments in three parts, and I'll give them to you right now. Verses 1 through 5 are an accusation. Accusation. Uh, Verses 6 through 9 are imprecation or retribution. Same idea. Remember, an imprecatory psalm is a psalm of judgment. That's what imprecatory means. It means to judge. So retribution is the second one, verses 6 through 9. And finally, verses 10 and 11, execution. Accusation, retribution, execution. Number one, accusation in verse 1. Do you speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? Now, the translation here is interesting. David is asking a rhetorical question. Do you indeed speak righteousness? No, you don't. Do you judge uprightly? No, you don't. 
So it's a negative formed question here, but the Hebrew word there for gods in some of your translations, the word is elim. Elim literally means silent ones, which I think is a much better translation, and I, and I wish the guys had used. Do you indeed speak righteousness, silent ones? In other words, what David is saying here is, are you silencing righteousness? Would you silence righteousness? Would you just not speak when misjustice, injustice is going on? Do you silence it? To these judges, he's saying, you're not speaking truth. You're not judging uprightly. Last month, you read, we talked about this on a Wednesday night, Chief District Judge Von Walker overturned California's Proposition 8. The voters of California said, no, we're going to maintain marriage as between a man and a woman. They said that, a ban on homosexual marriage in California. And Judge Von Walker came out, heard the arguments of both sides, and overturned it, blocking the ban, therefore immediately making gay marriage available in California. My opinion, it's a blatant case of judicial bias. Judge Von Walker is himself a homosexual. Oh, Where's the impartiality in that? You know, if it was a case, if, if it was an evangelical Christian outspoken who was sitting on the bench that day, there would have been outrage. It, they would have called for him not even to try the case because of bias. This is what's going on in our culture. And David approaches this in his culture. Look at verse 2. No, in heart you work unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. These false judges in David's day are weighing in on the side of violence and criminality because it's not truth that interests these judges. It's special interests. And I mention that because today we're watching a a season of time in our own country where objectivity doesn't seem to matter. Where truth doesn't matter. Personal preference takes precedence over truth, as in that ruling by Judge Walker. Now, I'm going to sidebar for a moment, and this is one of those things that some might find offensive, but I have to be straightforward with you all on this. Over the last, well, over the last seven years at the bridge, the issue of homosexuality has come up a number of times. I recognize that. I know. I know we've talked about it. I know we've, we've dealt with it, especially when Scripture has brought it up. And I have been asked the question, why do you have to be confrontive about homosexuality? Why, Pastor Rick, do you have to talk about it? Why don't you just, just you know, hold that. It's your opinion. Hold your opinion to yourself. Don't get political on us. I need to address this. Why do I address the issue of homosexuality? Because it is the single most contra- uh, confrontational sin issue facing the church today. In other words, it's not that I'm going out there, and I don't want to talk about this. But I'm not out there pushing that agenda or pushing against it. It is being forced on the American people and especially on the church today. Mainline denominations such as the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, the Episcopalians, and many others. And all you have to do is Google homosexuality in the church, and you will see this dialogue happening where the church is caving right and left, embracing the homosexual lifestyle. The church is. I'm not even talking about culture and society. But the church is embracing this as an okay thing. They're calling it open-minded acceptance. It's this enlightened tolerance. The Bible calls it exchanging the truth for a lie. It's called, some say, I was born this way. It's natural. The Bible says it's unnatural. Some say homosexuality is determined at birth. The Bible calls it depravity. These are not my words. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. All three of those things I just pointed out can be found right there. So the issue for me, and this is Rick as a pastor, as homosexuality confronts the church, do we bend and twist with culture to legitimize homosexual behavior? To say, you know what? Everybody sins. And therefore, because everybody sins, we've just got to embrace everybody where they are. Do we embrace a culture of homosexuality or do we teach truth? Sean and I were driving down the road the other day and... This little station wagon car was driving along with a little grandmotherly lady at the wheel. 
And as she went by us, we saw the first bumper sticker that said, Voting Moms. And I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. And right next to it, I support same-sex marriage. I mean, my worldview just kind of, you know. And I don't know anything about this lady, but I'll tell you what. She struck me, if I were just looking at her, she just struck me as a, as a nice, church-going, elderly woman. The way she looked. And here's the thing. She may very well have been. Because, again, in the church today, there is this embrace. Church leaders are using the cultural relevancy argument. They're saying the church frowned on divorce 30, 40 years ago. Perhaps homosexuality today is like the issue of divorce was 40 years ago. We're okay with it now. So maybe that's just where we need to go with homosexuality. Gang, absolute truth is an unchanging thing. Just because culture changes or because we want to be, and again, to those of you who are the more compassionate and tender-hearted, who look at someone who is homosexual and says, but I just, we we just got to love, we just got to pull them in and and bring them into what, listen, I understand the heart, but we've got to start with the truth and absolute truth does not change. Therefore, cultural relevance is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what culture is saying. What matters is what does the word of God say? which has been unchanging for the past two millennia. Abraham Lincoln once said, If I am right, everyone will know it soon enough. If I am wrong, a hundred angels swearing I am right will not prove it. It's a good word. Here are some problems. And again, I, I, just, I need to address this. We'll get back to Psalm 58, but this is part of the problem. Understand that the Bible makes no provision for homosexuality. There were even provisions in Scripture made for divorce. So if you want to compare the two, there were provisions for it. Jesus himself said that there's an adultery clause. If there is adultery, then there is an exception and you may get divorced. And the the Hebrew Scriptures, Moses gave them the right to get a divorce. Jesus said because of the hardness of heart. But you look in the Scriptures, there is provision for divorce. I'm not saying it's right in every case, but there is provision made for divorce. You will never find a single provision throughout the Bible for homosexuality, ever. It's not there. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. The Lord recognizes sin happens. He understands that we have a sin nature, but nowhere in all Scripture does He make provision for a sin lifestyle. And you've got to understand the difference. Romans 13, 14. Paul said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Don't make lust easy. Don't make provision. Don't don't make room in your life for lust to happen. Ironically, you you realize you cannot use the all have sinned argument, and and people do. For homosexuality, they say, look, we're all sinners. We've all sinned. So how is it any different? We need to accept the homosexual because all of us have sinned. You can't use the all have sinned argument without admitting, first of all, that homosexuality is a sin. So the second that is raised to you is an admission that this is a sinful thing. And beyond that, there's a difference between the sin nature or committing a sin, which we all do, and living in a lifestyle that is in rebellion to God. And that's the issue. That's the difference. 1 John 3, 9, John said, no one who is born of God practices sin. doesn't mean you're not going to sin. You will. I do. But we're not going to practice it. You know, as a musician practices music or an athlete practices his sports, but, but, Pastor, what if people truly can't help it? What if they're born homosexual? Look at verse 3. <laughs> the wicked, David writes, are estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. In Psalm 51, verse 5, David would say, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. What is he saying? That everybody sins right out of the womb, right from birth. We have that sin nature. But just because I have certain tendencies that I have from birth doesn't make acting them out okay. 
My little son David, two years old, has a tendency to punch me in the face. That's not okay. It's just the way he is. It's just the way he is. He's a violent child, but we love him. And as he's being convicted of murder, 20 years down the road, to sit in the courtroom and say, ah, but you know, it's, judge, it's the way he is. He's been brutal from birth. <laughs> Can't we just accept him as he is? I, I'm not even going to get into all of the, the debate about whether someone is born gay or not. Honestly, it doesn't matter. We're all born sinners. Does that mean we then have the right to live, to act out a sin lifestyle? Well, I was born an alcoholic. Therefore, you just need to accept me as an alcoholic. I was born a drug addict. You, you, I've had that tendency since I can remember. You've just got to accept me for the way that I am. Listen, we all have sin tendency from birth, which is why we need to be born again. All of us. Why? To allow the Spirit to work against my natural tendencies. That's the whole idea. God saying, I know you're sinful. Let me change that in you. Let me alter the behavior. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of of God. Why is that? Because unless I'm reborn by the Spirit, all I have is my sin nature to offer. Jesus says in John 3.21, He who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested, listen, as having been wrought in God. What does that mean? It means when we're born again, we enter into a new life, and now, suddenly, I'm being formed and changed by the Spirit of God, so that even my actions and my behavior are not what they naturally would be. They are now supernaturally what God wants me to be. And Christians understand, if our behavior is not being changed and altered to be more Jesus-like from day to day, then i got to ask, have we been born again? If I'm not more passionate for Jesus this year than I was five years ago, something's not right because He is altering me. His Spirit changes me, sanctifies me. But listen, the man or woman who believes himself or herself to be homosexual needs the grace of God every bit as much as I do. But here's another problem. As mainline churches embrace and approve the homosexual agenda even in the name of grace... They are in reality denying the very work of grace necessary to save a person. If we accept people just as they are, if God accepted me as I well, He did. He accepted me as I was, but He did not leave me there. He requires, He demands, He calls me to change by His Spirit. And if we just say, look, you are who you are, and come be a part of this and stay who you are then we are denying the need for grace. We're literally denying salvation. To my mind, and maybe I've got a twisted way of understanding this, but to my mind, the most cruel, heartless, and mean-spirited thing you can do is to deny the homosexual the right of of seeing the truth. Because what you're saying is, come just as you are, stay that way, don't... Change, don't be born again, don't invite Jesus to alter the behavior and lifestyle, and by the way, go to hell. (laughs) You wouldn't say that to anybody. So how do we respond then to friends and co-workers and family members who are living the lifestyle? What do you do? Approval is not the answer. Grace is the answer. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.25, with gentleness, hear this gang, because this is the other side of the coin, is that doesn't give any of us as Christians the right to bash the homosexual. The right to be condemning in our treatment or cold-shouldered. No. Paul says, with gentleness, correct those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Listen, you're not in opposition to the homosexual person. They are in opposition to God. And because you're not in opposition, we are called by the Lord himself, we are called to be those who have compassion and truth. To show love 
but also to speak truth. To not be afraid to enter into a relationship with someone who claims to be homosexual. To not shun and be cold-shouldered, but to enter that relationship and be kind-hearted and tender. But at some point to be honest and say, you know, I care about you too much not to tell you what I see going on here. Oh, but we're going to feel respond so negatively. You can't, hand, you can't, you know, worry about that. Well, back to Psalm 58. So that's, that's just where I'm at with all that. The psalm is not an imprecation against homosexuality. But it is against the dramatic lack of righteous judgment and even justice in this world. We do not understand justice in this world. At least the way the Bible describes it. We in America, we have a moral code. System of laws. Why? Well, originally they were based off the Ten Commandments. Why? Because the Ten Commandments stated things that if we would follow, we would not do so much harm to each other. We wouldn't hurt each other. We could learn to love each other if we could stop stealing from each other. Stop coveting what our neighbor had. Stop committing adultery. Stop committing murder. Stop lying. All these things that when we do them, we hurt each other. The Lord says, don't do those. And so when the founders began America, they said, that's really a great standard. Let's base our system of laws off of that so there won't be so much lying. Roger Clemens is dealing with that right now. And there won't be cheating and stealing and murder and at the same time, or at least at one time, adultery and sexual sin was frowned upon in our country. These things are not okay because their violation hurts people. And yet one by one, as sin takes hold of our culture, we go from appeasing such sin to approving of such sin. The accusations continue. Verse 4. And this is interesting. Against the wicked and the unjust, David says, they have venom like the venom of a serpent. Like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or a skillful caster of spells. David is saying, my judicial system is full of snakes. Snakes who cannot be charmed even into a different way of behaving. And listen, that's important. You don't charm the sinner out of their sin. It never works. If we just appease poisonous behavior, live and let live, perhaps we can charm the sinner. It will never work. Why? Because sin is voracious. Just by being nice doesn't work. What is needed is the injection of truth. In the very next psalm, David will describe his wicked enemies as dogs. And he has this to say about them in verse 15 of Psalm 59. They wander about for food and they growl if they're not satisfied. A picture of sin. And a picture of as we appease sin, you know, my dog gets hungry the very next day. It's really annoying. <laughs> and my dog, Reggie, he has figured out. We, uh, my mother-in-law, Sharon, took over the feeding responsibilities for Reggie. She said, hey, I'll, I'll just make sure he's fed every day. Fantastic. Great. You know, after the first day that she fed him, around 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the afternoon, the next day at 4 o'clock, guess where Reggie was? Lying at her door. Just waiting. And every day at 4 o'clock, if you want to find Reggie in the house, that's where he'll be. And if she doesn't come out, by about 4.15, he starts to whimper. And by 4.30, he's grumbling. (laughs) Well, my dinner, feed me. You know, he just, he needs the feeding. And sinful lifestyles, gang, are not satisfied to quietly live and let live. This thing that the newspapers call the homosexual agenda... Live and let live. Okay, look, that's fine. We're, we're just, we're just going to kind of appease. We're going to turn a blind eye and just say, you want to live that way? Go ahead. Because it used to be punishable in this country. But we got to the point where we said, you know, that's not right. Just, if they want to, that's fine. Just let. And now, what's going on? It's always more and more and more and more. It's never enough. Sin is never appeased. So our appeasement changes to approval. Because carnality always craves more. Now, this is David's accusation against the judges. He's looking around and saying, this is is bad news. It's a bad situation. It's unjust. It's wrong. And now we come to the imprecatory portion of the psalm. Retribution. Part two, retribution. David goes on to give six descriptions. 
and six destructions for these biased judges. And the word pictures are graphic. The first one is toothless lions. Look at verse 6. Oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Interesting, he was just referring to the unjust as snakes. And now he's referring to them as young lions. Why young lions? Because they have a father. Snakes and lions. Shatter the teeth of the snakes. Break the lion's fangs. Why snakes and lions? Because that's exactly how Satan is described in Scripture. A roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. The serpent of old, Revelation 12, verse 9. Snakes and lions. These are the unjust. He's saying, in essence, the unjust are offspring of their father, the devil. Jesus is having an interchange with the Pharisees. And in the midst of this, they're claiming, first they claim their father is Abraham. And Jesus says, well, Abraham saw my day. And they they claim that their father is God. And he says, no, that's not true. He says, you... John 8, 44, are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. David says, snakes and lions, man. These are the unrighteous. These are the unjust judges. These are those who don't care about righteousness. Snakes and lions. And he says, break their teeth. Take the bite out of their lies. He continues in verse 7. He says, let them flow away like water that runs off. So toothless lions and now water running off. Which for a Hebrew living in the Middle East would be very vivid. Because throughout that desert region there are wadis. Most of the time the wadis are completely empty. They just look like dry riverbeds. But there can be flash floods instantaneous when the rains come that gush down those wadis. And yet within a day or two, those flash floods, those full rivers suddenly are dry again. And David says that's what unrighteousness is like. It just withers away. Dry creek beds that quickly disappear into the ground. He says, Lord, that's what I want. Anyone who's unrighteous, may they disappear into the ground He says, when he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Headless arrows is the third description here. Literally, as though they were cut in two pieces. As though the the unjust judge goes to bend the bowstring and then snap, the arrow bends, and when he fires, it just plunks to the ground. He cannot fire off false judgments anymore. David says, let the arrow break. He says in verse 8, and I like this one, let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along. Did a little research on snails. <laughs> Did you ever sprinkle salt on How many of you? Come on. Sprinkled salt on a snail just to see it bubble. You are a sick lot of people. I did too. Now, the truth is I haven't <clears throat> assaulted a snail in many years. <laughs> but did you know the slime that snails secrete... Oh. When they go and they leave that little trail behind them, it is death by dehydration. They are dehydrating as they go. They don't live a long life. But basically what they leave behind there is the very fluids of their own life that they need to survive. And yet as they go, they just, they're, just, they're, they're a picture of unjust judges, really, because they're dying as they go. And they melt as they move along. And the reason why salt has such a negative effect on them is because salt literally pulls all the hydration out of their bodies, making them die more quickly. Rebellious bias, unfairness, a lack of judgment. These things work like dehydration. Why? Because they lack living water. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Spirit of Truth. And He's called living water. And He hydrates our spirits with what is real and true and absolute. And without that, we dry up and we die. Verse 58, continue, or 8, going on, he says, like miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. David here is concerned with the miscarriage of justice. He's saying what's going on here is not right. It's the death of truth and righteousness in Israel. He is outraged as we should be. As we see this going on in our own country. Verse 9. 
Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. Now what's this about? He's talking about kindling here, blown by the wind. In the desert region, you would go out and you would find thorns, and they made great kindling, bramble bushes, in the desert. that are a good source for that. But David says about the unjust, he says, God, may your whirlwind come before these wicked men can cook up their injustice. Sweep them away. The green and the burning alike. The green and the burning alike. That is, the unjust measures that are already burning, like Roe v. Wade. Or the unjust measures that are sitting in the docket, ready to be ignited. David says, destroy them all. If it's unjust, don't even allow it to see the court. And both will be swept away by the righteousness of God. This is inspired imagery all the way through. And what David discovered about these judges was rather than advocating or advancing righteousness, they were advocating rebellion. And when you offer injustice, that's what you're doing, advocating rebellion. Gang, it's one or the other. Please hear me on this. I know this sounds very cut and dry, but it's one or the other. You are either advancing righteousness or you are advocating rebellion. And here's the problem with this issue of what we, uh, so-called tolerance. If you're tolerating without advancing the truth, if you're just tolerating things as they are, you are advocating rebellion. We're saying it's okay to be in rebellion against God. It's an either or. The jury is not out. (laughs) The ruling is absolutely clear. Keep your finger there and go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. One of the most significant and important passages in all of Scripture, Romans chapter 8, as Paul deals with this issue of the law of the spirit of life and condemnation. He says, and I love this first verse, there is therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Let me ask you, how do you define yourself? What is your self-definition? I don't go around saying, I'm a heterosexual. That's how I define myself. That is fleshly thinking. I define myself as a disciple who Jesus loves. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's my definition. What's the difference? One is spiritual, one is of the flesh. Read on, verse 6. For the mind that is set on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so. And my friends, someone who is caught up in any sin lifestyle needs our compassion and love as much as the truth because in many cases it's not even recognized that the lifestyle they're caught up in is hurting them. It's self-destructive. It's not even recognized, as, as Paul said to Timothy, that they're captives to the enemy. And it's our job to bring compassion and truth that they might be set free. Verse 8, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you... Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Why is this so important? Because righteousness goes to the very nature and character of God. It's who God is. He is righteous. And we can accept all manner of sinful lifestyles here on earth, but the truth is God is righteous and cannot 
and does not abide sin, you cannot enter into His presence while living in a sinful lifestyle. Because of who He is. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.14, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it's written, you shall be holy. Why? Because I am holy, God says. Listen to that again. You shall be holy. Because I am holy. I want you to be like me. It's not the mindset of holier than thou. It's the mindset of holier by Him. And I need that. But I look around and I look at the church. And I spend probably way too much time thinking about the church today. But I ask the question, are we incensed by injustice anymore? And I wonder what's happening in our country. What's going on in our churches Even in our homes and our families where we approve of and therefore advocate all manner of rebellion. What's going on? How has it become okay for Christians to look just like the rest of the world? For there to be no apparent difference in how we live. Is God okay with that? I'm not asking about your opinion or mine. Is God okay with that? The same God who said, be holy. Because I am holy. Well, Rick, what can I do about it? After all, if I say anything, it can and will be used against me in the court of public opinion. (laughs) I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And so, as Christians, go back and look at verse 1. We do what these unjust judges were doing. We remain silent. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O silent ones? Do you speak righteousness in the workplace, in the home? I had a challenge yesterday. Corey's out of college now. And uh, staying at his, has an apartment over in, in Mount Vernon. And he's thrilled, you know, 20 years old, out of the house. And Hayden wanted to go stay with Corey. And uh, Corey has a game that he knows, and I probably shouldn't tell you all this. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll tell you. Okay, he's got a game. It's a rated M game, M for Mature. It's, it's the latest in the Halo series. I have a standard at home that my son knows. No rated M games in the house, period. And it doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter what the reason is behind the rating. Those games are not allowed in our house. Corey is 20 years old. It's his choice. <clears throat> he can't bring it home, but, you know, so he has it. And Hayden went out to hang out with Corey last night and, and said, Hey, um, Dad... Could I play Halo with Corey just this one time? I'm like, Charles Spurgeon never had to deal with questions like that. (laughs) And we talked for like an hour and struggled back and forth. I'm like, well, you know what my standard is, Hayden? Yeah, but Dad, it's not in our home, and so the little ones won't see her. I know that, but but I have a... yeah. And so, you know, I struggle with this. Oh, we're driving out to Mount Vernon. I'm struggling all the way out going, Lord, help me, because on the one hand... I want to promote righteousness with our children. On the other hand, I don't want to be the no dad where it's no, 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 no until my son finally goes, yes, and goes off the deep end. So it's that whole parental balance thing. What do I do? And I pray, and I'm just driving out there thinking and praying. We finally pulled up, and I go, I go, Hayden, you know my standard. You're going to have to make the choice. You're not going to tell me? No. You know what the standard is. You've got to make the choice. And we dropped him off and drove away, and my heart was just like breaking. And we picked up Hayden two hours later. And he got in the car and he goes, Hey, Dad, I didn't play it. <laughs> Little victory. <laughs> I said, Why not? He said, Because I knew you didn't want me to. That's good enough for now. That's good enough for now. Are we silent about righteousness? Are we just... Oh, whatever you want to play, kids. That's all right. I have an opinion, but I'm not going to give it. Are we going to speak truth? I don't want to be among the silent ones. The word, you know, O gods, in verse 1. Do you speak righteousness, O gods? Do you speak righteousness, O silent ones? That's not me. I hope that's not you. What did David do? And here's the real question when it comes down to it. What did David do? I know what he didn't do. 
Though he called for it, David did not break teeth. David did not snap arrow shafts or assault the unjust like snails. (laughs) He also didn't remain silent. He prayed. He opened his mouth and he prayed. He brought this issue of injustice before the righteous judge. Before David got political, David got prayerful. David laid it all out before God, and very honestly, and he prayed against the unjust judges. Wait a minute, Rick, are you saying I should pray against? Yes, I am. I'm saying we should pray against injustice when we see it. We should pray against wrong teaching in our education system. We should pray against the entertainment industry. Why? Why? Because Deuteronomy 32-35, God said, Vengeance is mine, and retribution in due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. And the potency of our prayer is that we call upon the only one who can dole out perfect justice. When I try to dole out justice, it gets messy. But when I pray to God... To bring his justice and his righteous judgment. It's always right. It's always perfect. Paul said in Romans 12, 18, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. See, there's the tenderness factor. There's the compassion factor. Be at peace with all men. Love people. Care for. Be compassionate. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32. If your enemy's hungry, Paul quotes, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, how does that work? It works because the righteous judge will judge righteously. And so he takes my hand off the gavel and asks me to lift it in prayer. So rather than sitting around being judgmental, we offer and call all judgment to the Father. It doesn't mean watering down the truth. Do not destroy this word. What it means is we prayerfully bring our cause of judgment or injustice to God first. Now, tender-hearted ones, hang on, it ain't over yet. Judgment is coming. Number three, execution. Verse 10. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. Listen, we know his wrath is coming. If you've read the Bible at all, you know the wrath of God is coming and He has told us it's coming. Just as He told Abraham. And there's an interesting connection because Abraham was called a friend of God. And Jesus says to you and to me, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, you are my friends. He says a friend doesn't keep things from another friend. A friend discloses all that he's about to do. And so the Lord has disclosed disclosed to us... This issue of his wrath and his judgment that is coming. Just like he told Abraham. He's speaking with Abraham. He tells him you're going to have a son, Isaac, and Sarah laughs. And there's that whole, that whole story there. But then as, as God turns away from Abraham, he says in Genesis chapter 18, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God's about to do something big. Should I not let Abraham, my friend, should I not let him know? And so he informs Abraham of his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He lets him know. Well, Abraham reacts as many of you would react. Far be it from you to do such a thing. To to slay the righteous with the wicked. So the righteous and the wicked alike are, are, are judged. Far be it from you. Abraham cries out, and then he goes through this whole issue with, with the Lord. He haggles with God. What if there are 50 people in Sodom who are righteous? Would you destroy 50 people? God says, okay, I won't destroy 50. What if there are 40? Maybe there's just 40. <laughs> All right, Abraham, for 40. Well, what about 30? <laughs> and the whole conversation is hilarious. 
As Abraham tries to bargain God down until finally he says, Ten? I mean, what if you can only find ten men in the entire region of Sodom and Gomorrah who are righteous? Would you, would you destroy them? And God says, no. For ten men, I will save the entire region. By the way, side note, can God change a region with ten people? You bet he can. If there are ten, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know the rest of the story. There weren't. Abraham asked God a question. And the question was answered in the fullest. And the question was, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? God says, All right, I'm going to show you my justice. I will deal with perfect justice. And you know what happened. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And it was right. And it was just. And it was God's call. Abraham and David did the same exact thing. They both took their concern to God. David prayed for justice. Abraham prayed for mercy. Both went to the right source. Both recognized that right judgment belongs to God. But we come to the end of this, and it's difficult reading. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. How does that work? Uh, Pastor, I cannot imagine, you might say, rejoicing at the suffering and the punishment and the execution of God's wrath. We're supposed to rejoice in that? I can't, I, I can't even fathom that. If it has to be, so be it. Just don't let me see it. I've had people say, hey, when the church is raptured and we're caught up, are we going to be able to see what's going on on earth? You know, that whole tribulation, God's wrath thing. I don't want to see it. I, I just assume. Now, some of you are like, I want to be in the front row. <laughs> and you all need some serious counseling. But... <laughs> There are those who say, I don't want to see the wrath. And David writes, the righteous will rejoice when they see it. He writes, he will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, which I believe is a direct reference to Jesus Christ. Because Revelation 19 says he is wearing a robe dipped in blood, and the blood is not his at that point, but the blood of his enemies. The righteous will rejoice. Compassionate people listen. And I have struggled with this one. Try and understand it and ask the Lord, what are you saying here? If it is righteous, if it is righteous for God to do it, it is right for us to rejoice in it. If it's righteous for God to do it, it is right for us to rejoice in it. And here's the bottom line with this with this psalm. This psalm, and actually every statement made about God's judgment in Scripture, is truly all about who God is. I told Tom and John this morning, we were talking about the, the worship song we're going to sing with. And after studying and thinking about God's judgment, I went through the songbook, the, our worship songs, thinking about what we would sing this morning. You know how hard it was to find a song that had anything to do with God's judgment? I'm like, grace, 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 love, mercy, grace, grace. Ah! That's all that's in there. And that's good. But we praise Him and we worship Him for His loving kindness and His grace and His mercy and His compassion and His tenderness and all these things. And how often do we recognize that our God is also a God of judgment? To the point that He should be feared. We have, we've forgotten this. God's judgment in Scripture today has been overlooked, forgotten, set aside. So that when we say things like, fear the Lord, people say, fear what? What is there to fear? God is awesome. He is perfect. He is holy. And let me just read this to you. Hebrews 10.26 says, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Willful sinning, lifestyle sinning. If I'm going to say, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live my way. He says there's not a sacrifice, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe... A punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? 
Blind acceptance of any lifestyle gain is an insult to God's grace. It's an insult to the death of Jesus on the cross. It's standing there as Jesus is bleeding out and dying on the cross and saying, I see what you did for me, but I'm not going to change. We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And the Hebrew writer says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Gang, we cannot mistake God's patience in this world for God's approval of this world. Just because God hasn't said anything, hasn't made a statement recently about different agendas and lifestyles and problems in our culture does not mean that He's okay with it. And yet many people in the church have mistaken God's patience for God's approval. And it breaks my heart to see where the church is going today. You know, I guess the reality is, yeah, I've talked about homosexuality a lot. I talk about the church a whole lot more. And my concern for our fellowship of Christians throughout the world and where we are. And we should. It's right to. Because Peter says in 1 Peter 4.17, it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. So honestly, the church is my first concern when it comes to holiness and righteousness and and living after the Father. But Peter also says if judgment begins with the household of God first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You know what the outcome is. Let's not mince words. Let's not play around. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He'll wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, surely there's a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. And as I said, when we began, it is not my hope that this psalm would lead us into vengeful thinking or even into guilty sorrow, but honestly, that it would lead us into solemn, prayerful worship. Because our God is a consuming fire. Our God is an awesome God. Scripture teaches God's going to pour out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting and sinful world. When the gavel of God's ultimate justice falls, we are told that the multitude in heaven will worship. Revelation 19, verse 1, After these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because His judgments are true and righteous. Down in verse 5 of Revelation 19, a loud voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to your God, all you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. And I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Judgment is His. And we must rejoice in His judgments. Because even His judgments, as much as His mercy, declare the nature and the character of God. 